I'm Caroline Hyde, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a big week for big tech, with Facebook and Apple taking centre stage on earnings. We'll break down all you need to watch for. Plus, the tech software startups that's vaulting into unicorn status and breathing new life into old data. Rubrik CEO joins us ahead. And as tech stocks drive the Nasdaq to yet another record close, Bloomberg speaks with CEO Adina Friedman. First to our lead, it was another banner day for US tech stocks, with the Nasdaq once again closing at a record high. Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle has been all over it for us, live from New York. Abigail, break it down, because I'm losing count. Which stocks are at record highs now? <laughs> oh, it's pretty amazing, Caroline. We are just seeing a very bullish run for the Nasdaq, putting in yet another set of records today, both an intraday record high, closing at a record high, with lots of stocks behind this. What also stands out about the day, though, is the divergence. The Dow actually ended up finishing down slightly, down about one-tenth of one percent on industrial weakness. But technology, it just keeps going. As for what did help the Nasdaq achieve new records today, lots of the usual suspects, including Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft. Apple, of course, as you mentioned, does report earnings tomorrow after the bell. Investors are looking for $2.02 and .02 in earnings on about $53 billion in revenues. They will also be watching to see what this cash pile looks like. Uh, thoughts are that it'll be close to one quarter of one trillion dollars. Really pretty amazing there, Caroline. And Facebook, the social media network uh, company, does report after the bell on Wednesday. And investors there are looking for 45% growth on both the top and bottom line. So both of these stocks put in record highs today, as did Amazon and Microsoft. This is the story of not just the day, Caroline, but the year. Let's hop very quickly into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag BTV 20, uh, excuse me, 7251, 7259, excuse me. On bottom in orange and yellow, we have the S&P 500 and the Dow both up about six to seven percent. On top, the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100 up about 16 percent. Just massive outperformance on the year driven by technology, Caroline. Check out that gap apart, quite amazing. And talk to us about the outperformance. Of course, that stands out. But what has really been driving this sort of market momentum? Is it all earnings optimism? Well, it has been quite a bit of earnings optimism. And I think that the idea that growth will continue, in fact, this is not true just for some of the true technology stocks, but two stocks that are actually consumer discretionary stocks, Netflix and Tesla. Both of these companies put in record highs today. Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Paul Sweeney on Netflix is saying this has to do with the fact that Dish's subscriber numbers were weak, that the this this suggests that and, uh, consumers are not willing to pay for cable as much. They're going to these online uh, streaming services. And then Tesla, one of the top performers for the NASDAQ 100, CEO Elon Musk did make bullish comments over the weekend, according to Kevin Tynan, a Bloomberg intelligence analyst. And super quickly, if we can just take a great uh, look at a chart, a great look uh, at a chart on Tesla. This is G hashtag BTV 3966. Tesla has been trading in that range of uncertainty. But recently, Caroline, it's popped out of that range. Dan Russo over at Needham is saying that he thinks that this is a very bullish breakout. It could take the shares of Tesla up to $429 per share. So some potential upside there. And super quickly, Twitter popping higher on the day by more than 6% after the Wall Street Journal did report that Twitter is teaming up with Bloomberg News to create a 24-7 streaming news plat on their social media platform, Caroline. So some really exciting stuff all around. It is indeed. Fantastic roundup as ever. Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doodle. Thank you very much live from New York for us. Now sticking with the markets, tech earnings season clearly upon us. We kicked off last week with tech giants like Amazon, Alphabet, both hitting record highs. As mentioned, this week Apple and Facebook are gearing up to release their numbers. Joining us now to dive into all these companies is my guest host, co-host for the hour, is Michael Wolf, CEO of Activator Technology and Strategy Consulting Firm. Wolf also was the president and COO of MTV Networks and former board member of Yahoo. You know everything when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to the rise of video. When it comes to this earnings season, I'm going into my Bloomberg right now. I'm looking at the outperformance of technology when I'm looking on uh, so far this quarter. 25 of the 51 tech stocks have reported, check this out, 92% have beaten in terms of an earnings surprise. The dominance with Alphabet, for example, is advertising. Does that bode well for something like Facebook when they're sharing that sort of a pie? 
Well, 75% of all internet advertising is going to these two companies. And at practically every incremental dollar is going to these two companies. And so they have a lot more headroom. In fact, all of the tech stocks have a lot more headroom because we still see a lot of money will be shifting into internet advertising. And at the same time, internet advertising on its own will continue to grow, not just as advertising shifts, but also other marketing expenditures like direct marketing go into internet advertising. So I'm looking at Facebook's revenue at the moment and it's set to jump 45%. This is what blows my mind is how these juggernauts among the most valuable companies in the entire S&P 500 are still seeing growth such as 45% in the first quarter of 2017. We saw double digit growth for Amazon, yeah, we exactly. saw it for Alphabet. Are you how are you advising those companies that you consult to to be able to compete with what are basically becoming almost monopolies, would you think? Well, at our, at, at our firm, we call them the discovery oligopoly because it isn't just about competing for advertising. It's about everybody else competing for a way in which they can find products, find information on the web. So today we have, you have to go through either Google or Facebook. If you have a, if you're looking for some sort of a retail product, it either goes through Google. A lot of searches for e-commerce start at Amazon. So for all of our clients, we're trying to find ways in which they can stay out of the mainstream of competition from those companies. They can create online brands, they can provide, they can create specialty e-commerce sites, they can find other sources of advertising revenue attached to TV shows that don't get in the way of those big companies. I see. So do you think there's room in the e-commerce world other than Amazon at the moment when we're seeing it really managing to dominate in that f sphere as well as AWS, it's Amazon Web right. Services part of the business, as, as well as almost advertising it's now getting into too. Right, o only 10% of all retail is going through e-commerce. And Amazon really only has 20% of that. So there's a lot more runway ahead for e-commerce on its own and then for Amazon taking a bigger piece of it. And in a lot of ways, Amazon is, is well positioned for a number of the big trends on the web. It's going to be e-commerce, it's cloud computing, it's going to be voice activated devices and for video. So they're all lined up for more growth and coming out of different sectors. Who impresses you the most out there. I mean, we can do it from market cap perspective. Apple's still number one, Alphabet swiftly behind, but who really does show real leaps and bounds in your mind's eye when you've worked with MTV, worked with Yahoo, and working with so many companies now? Uh, I mean, there, it's, it's really a close tie. I mean, I, I think the company that seems to have the best management team is Amazon. And it's not just that they're executing exquisitely, it's also that they keep innovating. Yes, Alphabet uh, has already has shown this quarter that a lot of the new businesses are getting traction, but it's Amazon that's been able to create entirely new businesses. And, and I'm confident that they're going to continue to be able to do so fascinating company that continues to disrupt from within. Thank you very much. Of course, Michael Wolf is going to be sticking with me. Here's my co-host, Activate CEO, here for the hour. Now, staying on earnings, AMD shares plunging as much as 8.1% in after-hours trading. The chipmaker announced quarterly earnings largely in line with analyst estimates amid the launch of new Zen chips. Now, the first versions of the company's new chips were on sale for about a month in the first quarter. Investors showed disappointment in the report as the results failed to provide a strong affirmation about that product. And in deal news, Cisco is planning to buy software-based networking startup Fiptela for more than $600 million. Now, that's according to people familiar with the matter. This is part of a bigger strategy that Cisco, which is shifting away from hardware, instead looking to software-based services. Both parties did not immediately respond to comment on the story. Now, coming up, software startup Rubrik just closed out a major funding round, now considered a tech unicorn, valued at over $1 billion. We'll get the perspective from both the company and the investor side next. This is Bloomberg. Now there's a new unicorn on the scene. Rubrik, a software firm focused on cloud data, just closed out its latest funding round, raising $180 million and pushing its valuation to $1.3 billion. Joining us now to talk about the deal and the broader tech market is Bipul Sinha, CEO of Rubrik, and Ashim Chandner. 
partner at Greylock Partners, an investor in Rubric. Gentlemen, it's great to have you around this table once again. And, Vipul, first of all, you didn't even start spending your $61 million you last raised. Why are you going out and getting double that this time round, three times that this time round? <laughs> We want to build Rubrik into a large, self-sustaining public company for the next 20, 30 years. And uh, last quarter, we hit uh, almost $100 million run rate. And we looked at the market demand, and we felt that we can really make a massive impact in the marketplace if we can double down on engineering and product, as well as our go-to-market around the world. And there is a market appetite for our product, and we want to become the newest standard for cloud data management in this world, which is emerged, turning out to be some on-premises and a lot in the public clouds. And so, Ashim, I'm looking at the Bloomberg's US startup barometer. It sort of measures the right. health of startups about VC funding coming in, IPOs, potential raising of funds. We're not nearly as high as we were back in June, July 2015. Time's not quite as perky when you're looking potentially going out raising funds. Is now the time to be doubling down, therefore, on the companies you really believe in? Are you, not, are you shying away from the newer investments? Uh, I think I think we're continuing to invest both in newer companies and also, you know, very selectively, uh, to use your words, you know, doubling down on the most important, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, companies out there as well. Uh, I think Rubrik, you know, truly has a very, very large market opportunity. Uh, every company, every large company today, and every mid-sized company today is looking to do, you know, what people call hybrid cloud. Yeah. Uh, have some of their IT assets continue on the premise, and have others go to the cloud. And as they kind of, you know, work in that mode, being able to manage their data seamlessly, if you will, uh, is a requirement everybody has, and, uni and Rubrik uniquely satisfies that. So the 180 million that you've been raising. Tell me how you're going to add that to the 60 million that you haven't yet touched and put it to work. I mean, is it, where are the priorities here? Is it geography because you're talking about going global? Is it, is it reinvesting in, in engineers and talent? It's, it's about like two things, which is the core of our company. Product, because we, we want to be the standard on, on cloud. We want to be the organizing principle for large enterprises for data that is living on premises as well as in the cloud. So we are going to double down on product and engineering and really triple our engineering team in the next 18 months. And then on the other side, we are going to actually heavily invest in go-to-market strategy and make our presence felt around the world. We are already in Europe, already in Asia Pacific, but we feel like the market demand is there for us to be more aggressive. More aggressive. You're raising money on the private markets. I'm seeing such a hot IPO market when it comes for to enterprise technology. You say you're looking to public markets in 10, 20 years. I mean, when do you, do you have a trajectory? Do you have a timetable? So we want to become a public company in the next two to, two to three years, but we want to build rubric into next the 20, 30 year company. And going public will be a milestone. That's not the goal in itself. Our goal is to build a large self-sustaining company. And what we are doing is we are looking at this market and building a comprehensive strategy to really build the foundation of a long-lasting company because we believe that just like what Google did in ca case of public internet, this multi-cloud world creates an opportunity for a company like Rubrik to really create an organizing principle for uh, business data. And that's what we are going after. It's certainly where we're seeing Microsoft putting a lot of energy into hybrid cloud as well. Uh, Ashim, last time we had you on, yeah. I do believe it was at Dynamics that That's then right. didn't go public. Right. Um, you were a great, you helped build that company really by fostering it in Greylock Partners, and and it got swooped and bought by Cisco. Interestingly, Cisco looks like it's on the acquisition trail once again today That's with right. another startup. Yeah. What do you think about the exit strategies here and where you would like to see companies going? Is it yeah. all about M and A? Is it all about IPOs? Does it not really matter? Yeah, so you know, I'd say I'd say most companies shouldn't go public because most companies don't have the length of runway, uh, you know, that let's say Rubrik does. So I think for most successful, you know, tech companies, you know, often the right path for them is is to eventually get acquired. Uh, I think in Rubrik's case, you know, just given the size of the market they're addressing, uh, every large and mid-size, uh, I think market analysts put this market at what fifty billion. Fifty billion. 
So, you know, that's a significant size, uh, you know, information technology market. And, you know, people's data isn't going away. Data is only increasing. And people have the need to store the data on-prem and on cloud. So essentially the idea is you can store the data wherever you want or back it, back it up wherever you want and then restore or, or have access to it wherever you want as well. And then on top of that, be able to do search, analytics, compliance, you know, all in a seamless way or holistic way. So that's kind of the, the vision. And you know, if one stands back and thinks about that, one can you know, very clearly see how this can be a very, very large and lasting company. We now got what? $240 million runway to go before we wish you well with spending it all. I'm sure it's a hard <laughs> task, but someone's got to do it. And Ashim, wonderful to have you here once again, really no, putting a you. perspective on the dynamics. Gentlemen, well done. Congratulations thank and thank you. you. Thank you. Now, a Japanese startup, Vinklu, is betting consumers want to forge an emotional connection with their digital assistants. CEO Minoru Takechi created Gatebox, which projects a mini skirt wearing avatar named Hikari Azuma inside a glass tube. Now, Hikari creeps users in the morning and sends them personal messages throughout the day. And unlike Apple's voice assistant Siri, Hikari doesn't mind flirting with users. Now, we recently caught up with Takechi and asked him about Gatebox, which he said caught the attention of SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son's brother. Masayoshi Sun's brother, Daiso, was so impressed to see our first test robot. He gave us advice and said it would become as popular as smartphones. We are very encouraged by his words. Now, Gatebox is currently available for pre-orders in Japan with a price tag of a cool $2,700. Japanese messaging service Line recently bought a majority stake in Finclu and plans to use Gatebox technology in its AI platform. More than 171 million subscribers in Asia use Line to read the news, hail taxis and find jobs. We'll see where there's more mini skirts than that. Now, coming up, we talk with Adina Friedman, NASDAQ president and CEO from the annual Milken Institute Global Conference in Beverly Hills, California. What she has to say about bringing capital back to the public equity market. That's next. And a feature we'd like to bring to your attention is our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You'll not only be able to watch us live, but also see previous interviews from our coverage around the globe and dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we feature. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Now, a mover we're watching. Bitcoin traded at a new all-time high. The cryptocurrency rose above the $1,400 mark for the first time ever. Bitcoin has risen in 10 of the last 11 sessions, gaining on the news that the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, will reconsider the launch of a US-based Bitcoin ETF. Meanwhile, we've been live all day at the Milken Institute Global Conference in Beverly Hills, California. Bloomberg editor-at-large Eric Schatzker caught up with NASDAQ president and CEO Adina Friedman and asked her about the thoughts on bringing capital back to the public equity market. Take a listen. I have a very balanced view of the private capital markets and the public capital markets. And I do actually believe that the private capital markets serve in a very important role in our economy in allowing companies earlier in their lives to grow and expand. And we would like to see more of that get into the hands of more investors over time by offering by more. By IPOs. Well, two ways. Uh. One is liquidity in the private markets. And we have basically announced um, or launched a new service within the Nasdaq private market that allows for more liquidity to occur in the private market market and including in private equity security private equity funds but we also would love to see them come into the public markets over time and create a, what, what I'll call a more sustainable liquidity environment for these companies to continue to grow you know since 2000 74 percent of job growth in the United States has come through public securities so once a company goes public 74 percent of the job growth occurs after going public so we do want public companies to find an inviting environment and we do find that there are there are remain a lot of impediments to a company choosing to go public because of whether it's the litigation environment, the tax environment, the, and as well as just the market environment for the stocks. Wasn't the Jobs Act supposed to fix that? So the Jobs Act definitely is a really good step in the right direction in a couple of ways. Number one, they allow companies to stay private longer by allowing two 
2,000 um, shareholders instead of 500. So it gives the, the companies a choice of when to go public as opposed to being forced to go public. The second thing is the confidential filings and the pre-marketing mm -hmm. allow them to understand how inviting it is. But that's just the first step, in my opinion. I think we should be looking at allowing those confidential filings much further up the chain. I think we also should realize and address the fact that being a public mar a security or a public company today has, comes with a huge responsibility. And the question is, how productive is that responsibility? Is it really an important element of them being a public company, or whether is we just putting a burden on companies um, inadvertently? You're trying to promote transparency into pricing for the benefit of investors on NASDAQ. You've talked about um, selected disclosure of short positions. Yes. Go into more detail about that. Yes, I think that disclosure is the hallmark of public, the public markets and just transparency and disclosure. So one of Because all things, we get right now is aggregate short interest. Well, we only get short interest and recognize that at 45 days after the end of every quarter, which frankly is an eternity today, but at least it's there, companies who have long positions in, um, in stocks have to disclose those positions. But if you've been shorting a security, you are never um, obligated to, to, um, to basically disclose those short positions. And you think ever. that should change? And that should change. It should be balanced. A company should be aware both of the long positions in their stock and who holds them and the short positions in the stock and who holds them. Today, they only have one side of the picture, but the investors, frankly, have an advantage over the companies, and I think companies should have a level playing field there. Can you do anything about that unilaterally, or does does that require the SEC to take action? It, it does require the SEC to take action. We've petitioned the SEC with a group of our listed companies to make that decision to take to require that disclosure. But it's really a matter of getting the SEC to kind of focus on it and prioritize it. And was Bloomberg's Eric Shatska speaking with Adina Friedman, NASDAQ president and CEO. And a quick programming note for you. Tune in for a Bloomberg TV interview with Twitter CFO and COO Anthony Noto. He sits down with Emily Chang to talk about the challenges facing Twitter as the company enters the big digital media buying season. That's the first on Bloomberg Television at 10 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And a new development in the net neutrality debate, a U.S. appeals court says it won't reconsider its ruling to uphold the government's net neutrality rules that bar internet service providers from slowing or blocking rivals' content. Now, the Federal Communications Commission is separately moving to revise the regulation. Chairman Ajit Pai spoke to Bloomberg Technology just last week to discuss why he proposed the rollback. 22 ISPs, small ones, told us just yesterday, Title II hangs over our businesses like a black cloud. And that's the kind of regulatory uncertainty and overreach that we want to remove because every American deserves better, faster, and cheaper internet, and I'm committed to delivering it to them. Michael Wolf, CEO of Activate and guest host for the hour, is still with us to discuss further. So rolling back regulation, is that always going to be a positive thing, do you think? This is what's, what's ironic here is this is a place where rolling back regulation could end up squelching innovation. And the reason is because then we're in a perspective where the largest companies will be the only people who can afford to be on the internet and it's going to be harder for smaller companies. And there are two different things. One of them is providing inexpensive access for Americans because there are a lot of people in this country who don't have access to the highest speed broadband. And the other is providing access to companies. And um, But I, I think no matter what happens, I don't believe that the largest um, ISPs are going to end up taxing companies for access. I think that there's going to be some, but ultimately they have a real vested interest in innovation. So interestingly, therefore, you think they could be self-regulating to a certain extent. That is what Ajit Pai is hoping, is you take away that regulation and actually the competition between the ISPs, the internet service providers will mean that they, they don't quash some of these new startups, but still we're seeing startups worrying. Yeah, I mean, think startups are very worried. And even the big companies are worried because they want there to be innovation. They want they're those... They're not voicing it, though, interestingly, particularly. They're going through their lobbyists, but we haven't heard sort of Netflix take a stand this time around. Well, the difference is Netflix is already paying for access. It's already paying for preferred access to subscribers, so there's an on-ramp directly from their, from their own servers. I think the difference is the larger companies are sending signals that they don't want this to happen. Uh, but at the same time, 
the, the internet providers, the internet service providers, they have an interest not only in innovation, but they have interest in their, in their customers being able to access everything on the web. So whether it's self-regulation or self-policing, I think we're going to see that happen. Interesting, and you're a man who should know. You'd worked at MTV, you've helped with, of course, on the board of Yahoo, and now consulting for many, a media and tech company, I'm sure, that's considering this. I want to look at also, this is a Republican heading the FCC who's coming in and wanting to yes. unroll Democratic previous rules. What about this new Republican administration? And we just heard today an American Technology Council is being founded by Donald Trump. He had an executive order today. Is that a positive? Um, it, it depends on what it's going to do. There isn't really much clarity around it, mm. but the idea that we can modernize the IT infrastructure of the government is a great one. Um, and, and by the way, it would be critical for enacting any of these regulations, whether or not it's going to be new health care or it's taxes. We're going to need a much better infrastructure. Um, we, are, we have sur far surpassed, I mean, com countries like Estonia are, are more sophisticated yeah. than we are. I mean, same as uh, London's always looked to Estonia as also as its infrastructure. Yeah, and at the same time, there's the other part of this, which is that we should expect that employees in the Valley and in other technology companies are going to be watching carefully that these initiatives aren't about um, listening or spying on ordinary citizens or creating registries of immigrants or Muslims. And there's a lot of concern that this could be disguised as a, as a way of more government intervention in people's lives. And yet, we really don't know what it means yet until there's some more flesh on the bones. What does give me a little bit of confidence is Chris Liddell, who's going to head this, yeah. um, is a technology veteran. He was at Microsoft before that. At GM, and so we have some leadership that's not coming from government, but really coming from the technology sector. It's interesting that you're saying it might be the Silicon Valley employee base who might rise up in concern about what this is really going to do as a council. But therefore, do you think they would be more positive or negative on their CEOs, their COOs, the likes of Sheryl Sandberg, the likes of Jeff Bezos? looking towards this council or providing executives to this council, would they prefer that they weren't anywhere near it? You know, everybody in the technology business wants there to be a voice. And so if their CEOs aren't on those councils, aren't involved, then um, they don't have a way of expressing a point of view or moving the administration into areas where it should be looking. And at the same time, a lot of the enterprise software companies are going to end up being uh, selling to any any uh, government effort. And so um, I think that, th that everybody, there's, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty around this. And it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out, who's on what side, who cooperates, and yet with caution. What about how we're seeing M&A and event occur because of the administration. I'm thinking our media world at the moment, consolidation within television. There's a bit of a fight going on between Fox for the Tribune. They're getting in on right. the act where, where perhaps um, there'd been a tussle with Sinclair. Do you think is M&A and consolidation going to be the path forward, particularly in the media space? I, th I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation, and partly because the FCC rules were really an anachronism. I mean, it really didn't. They all dated back to the time where if you owned a local TV station, you had pretty much a quasi-monopoly in a market, and those days are over. There's a lot of value in being bigger when it comes to station operators. Um, each of these companies, Sinclair is a great operator of TV stations, as is Fox. I don't know how it's going to end up. There's a reason why it's complicated, and one of them is because Tribune has a lot of real estate assets and other assets that don't fit in. Uh, but from a pure play perspective, uh, it's not the only group where there's going to be potential consolidation. We shouldn't think about whoever gets this, it's game over. In fact, uh, the game in a lot of ways on consolidation is just beginning. And this is this back off again from overbearing regulation as the Republicans have seen it, but do we think that that's in eventually going to help or hinder competition, whether we're looking at net neutrality, whether we're looking at consolidation, are the bigger players just getting too big? The, uh, they're, they're comp the whole sector is filled with, com with, with competition. Uh, it's easy for somebody to set up a new website. The websites, if you look at people like Vice and Business Insider and Fusion Media Group, which is owned by Univision, um, they're already reaching hundreds of millions of consumers and, and every day. So we shouldn't think about this just as a question of the big media giants. There's a lot of new companies that are emerging today.
and we hope that that long may that last. It's been great having you on, and of course, it was our discussion. Michael Wolf, CEO of Activate guest host for the hour and he's going indeed going to be sticking with us but coming up we head back to the Milken conference and hearing from working nation founder and ceo arthur bilger how he is his not-for-profit is shining a light on the future of work that's next this is bloomberg Now, President Donald Trump has continuously campaigned to bring jobs back to working-class Americans, yet not-for-profit Working Nation says if we want to mitigate future employment issues, it's not up to the federal government alone. Working Nation aims to create awareness and educate Americans on the rapid change of employment. We head back to the Milken Conference, where Bloomberg's New York Bureau Chief and Executive Editor for Global TV, Jason Kelly, is standing by with the Working Nation founder and CEO, Arthur Bilger. Hi, hi, Caroline. Great to be with you remotely and great to be here with Art Bilger. These are your people. <laughs> um, you know, you go back to the Drexel days and Apollo and so many of these big financiers are here, but you're here for a different reason. One of the statistics that just blew me away about the work you're doing is that something like 47% of jobs are going to be eliminated by technology in 20 years. Is that right? That's there are studies out there that are making that case. Uh, but I think one of the key things is more about how jobs will change uh, because they are going to change very dramatically as a result of... So let's dig into one very specific technology example, which is driverless cars. Right. Cars no longer have drivers. Those right. people will not have jobs. What happens? What, how do you flow through that? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I've been using that as an example for the last probably three years. Now it's obviously a very common subject. It's the number one job in 32 states in this nation. It's a staggering statistic. And yes, over, I don't know, it's five, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be, these are largely going to be eliminated. And the key is going to be how do we reskill and re-educate this, you know, middle, this is a middle class job today. Right. How are we going to reskill and re-educate these people? We actually have a panel tomorrow at the Milken Conference specifically on the concept of uh, how, how the reskilling and re-educating of the 48-year-old right. in this country. But these are, you know, obviously individuals. Some will be much more capable to reskill for, for the new jobs out there, and then some, you know, will clearly be a, a challenge. But one example I was using for a long time is, and hopefully we get back on track, infrastructure. You know, we're talking about a massive infrastructure need in this country, and I would think a lot of these people could be retrained and reskilled for the infrastructure jobs of the future. Let's talk about data and analytics, because that's something mm -hmm. that obviously is very front of mind for a lot of companies. Marketing certainly is an area where that is coming more and more to the fore, but data and analytics potentially could pe put people out of jobs. So what's the pivot there? How do you deal with that? So as uh, you know, I, I've, I've been very involved in the data analytics area for a long time. Uh, and uh, back in 08, I really started thinking a lot about this and how, for example, how a marketing department of 10 becomes a marketing department of two and you get better answers just through the massive amounts of data and the analysis and analytics that go along with. You know, we're still in the early stages uh, of that. But that is going to come on extremely quickly. And thus, those eight jobs in marketing that I spoke of, those are good middle and upper middle class jobs. Those are disappearing. However, data and analytics, there won't be an aspect of a business, government, or the not-for-profit world that won't be driven by data and analytics as we move forward. And thus, as a result, so many jobs with, with data and analytics skills are going to be created. It may be one of the greatest job creations in this country. So who's going to pay for all of it? Who's going to pay for all this training? Well, uh, what I've been working on is the whole idea of searching for the solutions out there. And to be very honest with you, my view is that solutions are largely at the local level. It's corporations, it's not-for-profits, academic entities and local government working in you know, different combinations together. And one of my efforts is talking particularly with corporations who are working in these areas, because I do believe corporations have one, the greatest visibility into the issues, they just have to look in their four walls, 
two, they better be looking carefully because they, otherwise they're going to have a tr problem five years from now. And are CEOs willing to pay for it, you think? We're getting, it's, it's beginning. You know, it's still a small group of corporations that are really taking the lead. But the, the awareness that this issue is coming on so fast is fine. That's what Working Nation's about. It's creating the awareness amongst massive audiences, including CEOs. Yeah. I was in a private session this morning with all, all CEOs, and I laid it out. And, uh, you know, but these guys generally had a pretty decent understanding. Um, that's great. Well, Art Bilger, it's great to be with you uh, here at the Milken Global Conference in Beverly Hills. The weather's nice outside, but we're going to get back to work. Caroline, I'm going to throw it back to you in San Francisco. So I'm getting all the fun. A fantastic interview. Great insight. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's New York Bureau Chief and Executive Editor for Global TV, Jason Kelly. Thank you as ever. Now coming up, the CEO of an online marketplace for buying and selling used cars shift on car ownership in the age of Uber. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully launched this Monday, carrying a classified payload for the US military. As with previous launches with SpaceX, the rocket booster landed back on Earth. SpaceX first accomplished the feat in December 2015, landing, refurbishing and reusing rockets. It's the key to the company's long-term vision. Now, times are changing for the auto industry. The evolution of the industry is exemplified by their Carvana's IPO, an online-only car dealer. The company's first day of trading shows that used car startups, they still got some work to do to prove their viability. Shares tumbled in its stock market debut and remain lower in Monday trading. So what does this mean for other startups in the space? Joining us now is George Arison, CEO of Shift, a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for buying and selling used cars. George, wonderful to have you here. And Thank you. Blessing or curse when a rival goes to the market and then potentially seems to have overpriced? So they, maybe they overpriced, maybe not. Facebook also overpriced and now is worth 6x what it was with IPO, right? So I don't think the first two days actually matter that much. But Carvana went public four years from launch uh, as a company. I don't know a lot of companies that do that. So I think they should be really complimented for achieving what most companies want to achieve and can achieve, which has become a public company. And they're still worth a billion and a half. Mm -hmm. Our revenue is half of what their revenue is. And so, for and we're you know a year and a half younger than they are. So I think it's actually really good news uh, for Shift overall. I want to ask CEO of Activate, Michael Wolf, to get in with a question on the business model. I'm sure. sure. When you look at there's already a strong presence of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, whether it's eBay or, or Auto Trader. You've got some features that are different, yep. including being able to try the car out at home. How soon till these other companies just clone what you're able to do? Operations are hard, and so I don't think most people are going to just clone what you do. If they w would have wanted to, they would have done it years ago. Um, and eBay has just kind of said and not done that. Uh, and m now what eBay mostly does is list cars on behalf of dealers to sell. Yeah, our model is very unique because we deliver the car to the customer for a test drive uh, to either their house or their office. And we do that through a very kind of flexible labor force model, plus an inside sales team that sells cars through phone, and then a ton of technology that allows you to get for example, financing online without ever engaging in the, with a human being, which no one else in nature actually does. Um, so we've built a really kind of complicated mix of ops and technology, plus this test drive delivered to customers, and I actually think it's really hard to replicate. Talk, talk to us about your growth. Um, so we've I've been really focused the last year and a half on unit economics and revenue. Um, our board was very smart, I think, early on to say, hey, let's stop this top line growth nonsense and let's instead focus on building a sustainable business. So we've grown revenue about 4x in the last um, year and a half, uh, or, in, or in 2016. Uh, we've become profitable in San Francisco and almost profitable in LA, um, which has been a huge deal for us. And now we're going to start adding more top line volume growth now that we're kind of sustainable and I can actually pay for operations uh, in each market without having to depend to venture capital for that. Michael. Um, well, you've also got uh, the ability to, to grow beyond uh, the, the core markets that you're in. Do you see a difference in terms of other markets and what the requirements? So I actually think other markets will be easier than San Francisco and LA um, because marketing costs will be cheaper in those markets just from what we've seen SF and LA are very expensive from the marketing cost standpoint and labor will also be cheaper. You know, we, here we are in the most expensive market outside of New York mm -hmm. and so we have to pay appropriately versus when we go to say St. Louis or Houston you'll be paying probably lower wages per hour um, and real estate will also be cheaper. So we store cars and you know facilities kind of off the beaten path so they're cheaper than the traditional dealer real estate but it's still costing us money. So I actually think new markets will be cheaper to, to do 
Um, we just haven't been pushing to go into new markets until we're ready because we felt that, you know, being in many markets and having a lot of top line growth wouldn't allow us to build a sustainable business versus and perfect the experience. Exactly. Yeah. With a sustainable business to be able to demonstrate, do you feel now is the right time to go for, for more funding? Do you need more funding to go into these new markets? So I tend to not talk about what we're doing on funding until we do it. Uh, but I, I mentioned to somebody else uh, last week that yes, probably in the next kind of quarter, there'll be some news on that. And very briefly, tell us about what are the, the headwinds or, or the wind in your sails that they might be? Because on the one side, you've got, well, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. Mm -hmm. we, what, do we really need to own a car anymore? But then again, people are looking much more to the second-hand market and online only as the ways to go if you are going to own an automobile. So for us, I mean, I don't know, we've become a really awesome place for millennials to buy a car. About 50% of our buyers are millennials. 70% of people who get a loan from Shift are millennials, which is really amazing. You know, AutoNation, which is the largest car dealer in the country, only about 30% of their customers are millennials. So we're way over-indexed in the area. And I think that actually tells you that millennials will continue buying cars. Maybe they'll do that later in age than their previous generations had done, but they'll still own a car. And at least in San Francisco, where car sharing and you know Uber lifts are huge, actually car volumes haven't gone down. They've gone up in the last five years. So, so far, there's an, and a lot of data to suggest that people will not buy a car. Fascinating. It's been great having you with us. Thank you very much indeed, of course. That was Shift CEO George Arison. And for the entire hour, I was very pleased to have my guest co-host, Activate CEO Michael Wolf. Thank you for jetting in from New York for us. Great to be here. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tune in later for a Bloomberg TV interview with Twitter CFO and COO Anthony Noto. He sits down with Emily Chang to talk about the challenges facing Twitter as the company enters the big digital media buying season. That's first on Bloomberg Television at 10 p.m. Eastern. And Tuesday, we are delighted to welcome Emily back. I'll be headed back to London to present on tech from across the pond after a brief stop in Boston. It has been an utter joy being your host for the past five months and soaking up all things Silicon Valley. I'll be seeing you east side. This is Bloomberg.